Good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here for today's Bridge Book Club discussion. Today, we are discussing The King of Confidence, the tale of utop utopian dreamers, frontier schemers, true believers, false prophets, and the murder of an American monarch by Miles Harvey. Today's event is hosted by Bridge Michigan. Today on the call, uh, I'll be our one of our co-hosts. My name is Amber DeLind. I'm the Membership and Engagement Director at Bridge Michigan. I'm joined by my colleague, Josette. Josiah Foster, who is our fund development associate. If you have any questions during today's conversation uh, for regarding the technology or anything else re related to Bridge, you can send those via direct message to myself or to Josiah and we'll help do our best to get you an answer for those questions. If you're not so familiar with Bridge Michigan, Bridge is Michigan's nonprofit nonpartisan news source covering issues that matter to you and to your community. I'm just gonna make sure that all of us are muted. Just one moment. All right. You can subscribe for free if you don't already at www.bridgemi.com. And also for those of you who are Bridge Club members though, or people who have donated to Bridge over the last year, um, you know that you get a number of benefits, including access to free electronic copies of each Bridge Book Club selection. So it's good to see so many Bridge Club member faces in this uh, room. You can become a member at any time, um, and we'll drop a link in the chat today so that you can, if you're interested in learning more about becoming a Bridge member, you can do so. Today, we are so lucky to be joined by author Miles Harvey. I'll give a full introduction of him momentarily, but we're incredibly honored that he was willing to join us for a discussion of his book. The schedule for today's discussion looks like this. I'll do a short introduction of, of author Miles Harvey and then lead a discussion with Miles about the book for about 40 minutes thereabouts. And then we'll shift to qu the questions that you have for, for Miles. And you can type your questions into the chat at any time during today's conversation, but please be sure that you do stay muted throughout the conversation. We'll then conclude the, today's discussion by 1 p.m. As you heard at the beginning, we will be recording this discussion and posting that recording in, in Bridge either today or tomorrow. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest, Miles Harvey. Miles Harvey is the author of the national and international bestseller, The Island of Lost Map, and the recipient of a Knight Wallace Journalism Fellowship at the University of Michigan. His book, Painter in a Savage Land, was named a Chicago Tribune Best Book of the Year and a Booklist Editor's Choice. He teaches creative writing at DePaul University in Chicago, where he is a founding editor of Big Shoulders Books and director of the DePaul Publishing Institute. Welcome, Miles, and thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, Amber, I'm honored to be here. Thanks. Well, without any further ado, I'd love to get us started to just talk a little bit about The King of Confidence. This was such a fascinating book. We got, I received dozens of notes from readers telling us how much they enjoyed it and, and our discussion on our Facebook uh, discussion group was really fascinating. So readers loved this one. I'd love to know if you would tell us a little bit more about yourself and why you chose to write The King of Confidence. So I'm a longtime um, journalist and also a, 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 I sort of walk the line between journalism and creative writing. I went to the University of Michigan years ago as a MFA student in fiction, and I'm sort of always uh, between those things. So I teach English, uh, what we call creative nonfiction at DePaul University right now. And um, I just um, have sort of made a niche for myself, I guess, doing what's called narrative history, where I um, try to tell a story um, and often a story that hasn't really been told or at least told in the way that I want to tell it. And th this um, subject was just really interesting to me. And I think one of the things that drew, drew me to this, Amber, was, you know, I'm a lifetime Midwesterner. I'm speaking to you from Chicago and I grew up in Illinois. And um, uh, this book's Midwestern um, uh, locale really appealed to me. I, I kind of feel like um, I, I don't have a big chip on my shoulder about, oh, the flyover people, you know, but I do think that um, Midwestern history is just such a vital part of American history, and it, and it often gets uh, not quite short shrift, but not full shrift either. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that I, I see some nodding heads on the cameras. I think that that what you're saying resonates with a lot of us. I, as, as a lifelong Michigan resident, I I uh, I 
understand and, and agree with a lot of what you're what you're sharing there. And so one of the things our readers tend to tell us that when we go into these books is that they'd love to hear about the process, about how these books come together from start to finish. Could you tell us a bit about your experience in writing this book and whether you've always been familiar with Strang or did your research of the time period sort of lead you to the story? Uh, it, no, I have, it's, an, it's an odd story and, and not, a, a, I think, a typical one. In the This is a very lucky um, uh, opportunity for me, this book. Um, so I knew a little bit about Strang because of um, a brother-in-law I have, who I'm quite close to, grew up in a town that your readers uh, will know about, Burlington, Wisconsin. Uh, the site of Strang's first utopian colony. And I remember, oh, it must have been 15, 20 years ago, I was up visiting him and his family in his childhood home. And, you know, we went out to the grocery store or something. I can't remember, but I remember we were driving around Burlington and he started telling me about this Mormon utopian colony in his little town of Burlington and how, you know, uh, there were still some Strangites there. And I, I remember just being like, wow, that's an amazing story. And then another writer friend of mine at, at one point had been looking into the story and he, he, he reminded me later that, he'd, that he'd, uh, he'd mentioned it to me and that I'd been fascinated, but I don't, I don't really remember that conversation. But um, about uh, six or seven years ago, I got uh, either an email or a call from my agent saying, um, an editor at Little Brown, a big New York publishing house, is interested in talking to you about a book idea. <laughs> and, you know, um, I, that doesn't happen super often. I'm, uh, you know, I've had a good career as a writer, but, you know, people are not busting down my door uh, often. Uh, and so the, this editor, it was, a, it was a really great relationship. This guy, Ben George, um, had known my first book, which was about a con man. Um, and, um, had said, you know, uh, I'm interested in having you write this book on Strang and um, told me about it. And and I, I was a little skeptical at first. I got to be honestly honest, Amber, just not because of, of but before I spoke to him, because, you know, I'd had some opportunities to people had come to me with book ideas before, but they were always like ghostwriting for a corporate executive or something like that. And I thought, ah, even if this is a money-making venture, I just probably should say no. I'd said no all the time before. But this one, instantly, I knew not only um, uh, what story I wanted to tell, but but how I wanted to tell it in a way that um, uh, hadn't really um, happened to me in, with past books. Um, and I think the big thing was, you know, um, there, there have been at least three good books about Strang, um, but they, they tend, to, and I was lucky to build on, on those, those writers' work, but they tend to um, treat Strang as kind of a footnote of Mormon history or a footnote of Michigan history. You know, there's this, it's, it's actually a, a quite book, good book by a guy named uh, uh, Roger Van Noord. It's called Assassination of a Michigan King by University of Michigan Press. And I saw Strang from the start as a lightning rod for uh, all the enthusiasms and um, craziness of mid 19th century America. So um, uh, this was a real uh, lucky break for me, this book. It was a blast to work on. That is so fascinating. I, and I, it never occurred to me that, you know, there might be, that there would be such a sort of an interplay between publishers and, you know, someone might reach out to an author and say, I have this idea. You know, I, I'm learning a lot about the writing process and the different ways it can come about through the, these discussions. So I really appreciate that. Well, sort well of even, sharing even how then, it there was a, a lot of work for me. I had to write like, a, I ended up writing a hundred page book proposal. Um, I, oh, I wow. happened to see a, a, a writer friend of mine over the weekend who, who's, he's a very, he sells really well. And I said, you know, he was like, do you have to write those hundred page proposals all the time? And I'm like, because those are excessive even in the book business. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of need to do it. I mean, how long are your proposals? And he said, oh, I don't, I don't do proposals. I just talk to the editor and tell him what I want to do. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, <laughs> okay. I don't do that. So. so one of the things that I found really fascinating as I was reading the book is how many sort of primary sources you included were included in the text, you know, the things like the newspaper, newspaper clippings, the playbills, et cetera, that really sort of helped you understand and get a feel for how, how sort of the word would travel during that time period. 
Can you tell us a little bit about your research process and how you were able to sort of acquire so, so many of those sources and include them? So um, I was uh, blessed in a few ways, um, Amber. So in terms of Strang's papers, et cetera, um, the Mormons then and now, and in Strang's um, sect, as well as um, the mainstream uh, Brighamite branch of the church, um, they are great savers of records. <laughs> and um, Strang's uh, followers, even though the colony, as you all know, was, was uh, destroyed, um, Strang's followers and wives uh, saved a lot of material. And there was a researcher in the 1920s and 30s named Milo Quaif, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, who did a, a good book on Strang um, and then donated his material to Yale. Um, so there was that repository of, and so that's all Strang's, or not all of his letters, but many, many of his letters, all sorts of original documents that you just, it was really great to have access to those. Then there are other libraries around the country, including Central Michigan University has a, a wonderful collection of Strang stuff and some stuff that's nowhere else in the world um, is at Central Michigan um, in the, in the histor historical, the Clark Library there. Um, but then where I got really lucky, I think with this is, um, Newspaper databases from the 19, newspapers from the 19th century have been digitized, and there are some really great databases that simply weren't available uh, to previous researchers. And so, and I'm a really dogged researcher. I got to say, I'm a pretty good researcher, but I'm also just like, I'm going to find this out. Um, but I was able to, you know, find kind of breakthrough stuff on Strang, or at least get hints of it. Um, you know, while I'm sitting uh, in this office at, you know, 2 a.m. in my pajamas uh, in a way that I would have had to travel all over the country and make all sorts of unlikely guesses about where to look before. And so that that really helped me. Um, and yeah, and, and, and also the other thing about those newspaper databases, as you point out, Amber, it, I was able to see how news travels, which is so fascinating. And, and then I was able to make some conclusions about Strang. I mean, I think one of the things, you know, I point out in the book that I, th I don't think other people really pinpointed is the way Strang used what was essentially something very much like the, the internet, a uh, proto internet um, to his advantage, right? He, he realized he could be on Beaver Island of all uh, obscure places and still get headlines in New York and sometimes in London and Australia and all over the world. Um, and he was very shrewd, um, manipulator of the media. He was brilliant at it. He had, was a newspaper man himself, quite a good writer. And first thing he would do wherever he set up a colony, including on Beaver Island, would be to set up a newspaper. Really knew how to use, um, what we, I, we can talk about it more, the exchange paper system. But he'd also worked at the post office as a postmaster. So, and, and that would be sort of like, um, you know, working at a, I, I don't know, a, a tech firm, you know, he really understood the media and the way it moved from different angles. And so he's very, very smart at manipulating the media. Thank you so much. That's so fascinating. That's one, I was kind of paying attention to the footnotes of where things were coming from. I noticed that, that Central Michigan University quite often was one of the places. So that's, thank you for, for yeah, that's sharing that. That's a great that. library. I, re I recommend that to um, uh, readers and uh, of the bridge and members of the book club. Thank you. So one of the things that this that last question sort of led me here, one of the things I really enjoyed about King of Confidence is how the story sort of focused beyond string. It really gave us a sense of the time period and the era. Uh, why did you decide to, to broaden your focus in that way beyond just sort of a profile and, and, and biography of string? Yeah, you know, I think it was essential to, it to um, the book. Um, as I was saying earlier, you know, if you look at Strang in a vacuum, it's a weird, quirky story. Oh, man <laughs> declares quasi-independent nation on Beaver Island, you know, it, and it's got this kind of Paul Bunyan quality to it. You know, it's it's Midwestern lore, you know. But um, when you look at Strang in the context of his times, he becomes more interesting um, because you see that he's a product of his times and um, uh, uh, embodying all this um, intense, crazy stuff from um, these 
utopian colonies that were popping up all over the United States at that time to um, abolitionism. You know, uh, he was just very much um, someone who, to me, felt like a conduit to write about America at a time of incredible upheaval and conflict. You know, this is these are the years leading up to the Civil War, but it's also just a, a thrilling time. There's all sorts of crazy um, movements. This is when we have spirituality. There's all you know, the table knocking and you know uh, seances and but uh, but all sorts of new religions popping up. Uh, he was certainly not the only sort of um, um, prophet that was running around the country with followers, but also all sorts of exciting things. You know, the women's movement starting out and in some ways Strang, um, he's tricky about women, but it was very progressive about that, but also just the, 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 the anti-slavery movement. And, and I just saw him as, as just someone sort of, uh, not a central figure in his times, a much written about figure in his times, but someone who really embodied those times and in some ways embodies us still, I think. Absolutely. Um, Marjorie, who's one of our readers, just dropped in the chat there that she really loved sort of the sprawling research aspect of it and that she might even check out that Melville book because that was such oh, a... Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the Confidence Man is, is a it's a weird book still, uh, Marjorie, uh, but it's um, it's uh, and a funny book, but it's a great book. I, I, I got to I confess that I like it better than um, Moby Dick. <laughs> I just think it's a wonderful book and you know as far as the the historical stuff I think I'm also sort of oriented that way like um I got it you know the book got a nice review in the New York Times which of course in the in the in the book section in the uh, Sunday book section which of course you know of course as a writer you're pleased about that but it's a writer I respect I, I don't know him but I, I really respect him but he called what I do um kind of a historical pointillism that you know you put the dot here you dot here the dot here and then you step back and you see the the bigger picture. And, you know, um, I, I felt like, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I, and I, and I didn't, I'd never thought about it that way, but I, I just, you know, I always tell my students, um, my writing students, you know, we, we don't live in a, on a blue screen. We're of a time and a place. And, um, um, it's not that we're completely without agency and that time and place okay. creates us completely, but um, we don't exist in a vacuum. And so I think to write about anyone, you have to write about the time and the place. Yeah, I just, I loved it. it, it I'm sure I'm not the first person to draw a comparison here, but it reminded me of one of my other favorite books, which is The Devil in the White City, and the way that it sort of painted a picture of the the whole of how, how this event was possible in this time period. So. Yeah, you know, I, I when when but even before I read that book, I was envious of that book, and before it was a bestseller and movies made, I just, you know, as a Chicagoan, a lot of us knew that story, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of us knew that it took place during uh, the World's Fair, and a lot of us knew how pivotal the World's Fair was to American history and Chicago history, and the brilliance of that book is is take stepping back and taking those two stories together. Um, yeah, he's got a good touch for that. He did the same thing with the invention of the radio and a crime. Um, so that, yeah, and um, yeah, I think Larson's really smart that way. So we've we touched on a couple of sort of themes that that really piqued my interest as I was reading, but one kind of related to the 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 bigger theme of the confidence man. So, you know, America really does seem to have sort of a long-standing fascination with reinvention and maybe even scammers and grifters. Um, in your opinion, I'm just curious, what is it about our cultural DNA that seems to maybe, if not reward, really kind of respect that behavior? You know, Dickens, yeah. you know, assessed Americans as being sort of respectful of criminals as long as they're smart. Can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. You don't want to make, you know, sort of trite, conclusions about our country because it's such a complex fascinating place um and of course there are con men all over the world and even before it um well long before the word was invented you know there have been you know i think americans i mean i think human beings um there were probably grifter cro-magnon people you know um but 
I do think that there is, you know, Dick, Charles Dickens, the novelist, as you said, came here in 1843, I think. And he was really struck by not just that there were grifters, um, but that Americans seemed to embrace them. You know, he, he was in Cairo, Illinois, this town in Southern Illinois, where there'd been this land scam. And um, uh, he, he said, the, but, but the people still hold, seem to hold the scammer in high esteem. And he said, but it, isn't he a total liar? Isn't he, hasn't he been shamed? Hasn't, you know, and they'd say, oh yeah, 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 total liar awful person awful person and they said well why do you like him and he said because he's a smart man meaning he he can get he can work his way around the system and i do think there's a kind of american attraction i mean it's just an instinct i'm no i mean this is something you know those of us on this call could argue about for the next uh three hours if we wanted to but i do think there, there there's a way in which we we americans seem to really embrace people who uh, lie right in your face and smile about it and said, yeah, I'm a liar. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, this, and we seem to say, well, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty great one, you know, like, so I don't know. I, I don't have any expert theories on it, but I think Dickens might be onto something. Yeah, it was just a fascinating observation. Yeah. Just because, you know, it, it's not as if it was a moment in time, though I think this was a was a high point for for the confidence man for sure. Yeah, well, it was a period where you know, you, I mean, speaking of um, smart men, you have P.T. Barnum running around. I think some of us right. kind of Barnum and Bailey circus, you know, but but uh, Barnum was basically a professional uh, hoaxer. You know, he would, um, you know, as you, as you know from reading the book, he would um, he had this museum and he would display a mermaid and. Um, some people would say, wow, I just saw a mermaid. And other people would say, I just saw a monkey stitched to a fish. And he, and you know, Barnum's whole thing was, oh, you think that was a monkey stitched to a fish? Why don't you bring your grandmother and have her look at it and pay admission price on Sunday and see what she thinks? You know, he just, but it's also where we get the word confidence man from. And we know exactly when that word came into being. And one of the cool things was to see how fast it spread through American culture. And I think it's just a time where and I think there are times like this in history where truth is porous, right? Where the, mm -hmm. where the truth isn't a hard thing. I think truth kind of firms up and softens up at different times in history. A lot of times having to do with technical changes in our, our world. And that there are people like Strang who are smart about exploiting that. Sure. Speaking of Strang, um... I really found that Strang's position on abolition and allowing men of color into the priesthood to be surprising, given that he seemingly had sort of a lack of moral conviction about most other things. Um, given your research, why do you think he took a stand on this issue? So for one thing, you know, Amber, I think he saw, this is one of the, the, th the places I think I really moved Strang's personal history along um, that re previous researchers didn't get he saw slavery firsthand. So when he was a young um, uh, lawyer in Western New York, um, he uh, had, was married to someone until um, the most recent book on, on Strang, a, a really a, a good uh, book by a woman named Vicki Cleverly Speak called God Has Made Us a Kingdom. People thought that Strang's father-in-law was a candle maker, but no, he was a canal contractor. And I, I took that little thing that Vicky had said, no, no, this is a canal contractor. And said, well, can I do some research on him? And I found out all sorts of stuff on this canal contractor. It was a really corrupt business. And this guy had basically took the money and run everywhere he went. But he also worked on a canal in Virginia that was um, built by slave labor. So his workers were slaves. So there was a letter in Strang's a uh, collection um, in at Yale, uh, a letter to his father-in-law saying, you know, I've just come out here and these can, how can you let people live like this? Um, people are drinking out of the, you know, water that is, you know, completely unsanitary, blah, 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 blah. And sticking up for the workers saying, you know, the black workers work harder than the white workers. Other people must have seen this letter, but I've never seen it in any, any other reference to Strang. I think simply because People had no idea what Strang was talking about. Like, why is he in Virginia? Who is he talking about? What's he talking about? And I was able to pinpoint that to Virginia 
to his father, the or father-in-law, uh, the canal contractor, and do some research on the conditions there. So I think Strang saw slavery firsthand. And I think it really left an impression on him. And I, you know, I always say in the book, like in, in talks like this, and I think I said in the book, I kind of think it's it's one of the few things he really believed in. You know, like he was he was willing to to adapt. And one of the things about con men, Amber, is they say, Oh, Amber, you like purple? Oh, I love purple, you know. Oh, you like green? I love green. Um, but but this is one thing he he was really um put his foot down on. And and you know, I write in the book about how he was in the Michigan legislature when the Republicans swept into power, which was an amazing thing in American history. This party that didn't exist suddenly took over uh, the governor's mansion and the Michigan legislature. It went, it's sort of, you know, we can argue about where the Republican party started, uh, but it definitely sort of emerged in Michigan. And Strang voted with um, the Republicans and his own, he's a longtime Democrat. They didn't like him and the Republicans didn't embrace him either. And, and uh, it, it, so it didn't help him at all. Um, but he, he fought hard at one point. He spoke for hours on the floor of the legislature in Lansing. Um, and he also uh, 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 sponsored some legislation um, to help escape slaves. Um, and it, it, he was really, I think, sincere about his um, belief in abolitionism. Uh, thank you for that. That is, it was just, you know, as I was reading, it was, like, as you say, one of those few times that it didn't feel like there was any sort of adaptation to the audience in his stance, you know, and I just, I was really kind of uh, shocked, kind of taken aback by it. Well, with Strang, it always kept both ways. Um, he also right? was trying to get money out of uh, one of the main rich abolitionist <laughs> so fair <laughs> um, you know and and he, he he gave a lot of talk about uh making beaver island a uh, hub for escaped slaves and i found absolutely no evidence that um that there were any escaped slaves on beaver island and that or that they would have been welcomed if they'd come there so interesting interesting uh another sort of one of um strange stances that that got me thinking. I, I, I found it sort of interesting that one impetus for the growing disillusionment among Strang's followers was that sort of the forcing of women to wear pantaloons. Um, I just am curious about why you think that was. Do you think it was really a proxy battle for the polygamy question or was it something else? I think you're very shrewd. So I think there were underlying things, mainly um, you know, Strang had been the anti-polygamy. When Brigham Young died, Strang was the advertising himself. And he said, I, I do not and never will and can't possibly ever endorse polygamy. And then until he started practicing polygamy, uh, when he died, he had five wives, four of whom were pregnant. Um, um, and on Beaver Island, polygamy, even by um, one of his uh, plural wives estimation was never popular. A lot of the people who'd come to Beaver Island had, had fled from Nauvoo, the great Mormon hub on the Mississippi River, um, and had come to, to Strang's colony first in Burlington and later in Beaver Island because they thought, well, this is a place where we don't have to deal with that mess. And then they had to deal with that mess. So, so And there were other, all sorts of other underlying tensions. Uh, but I think his um, insistence on all women on the island wearing pantaloons, which looked to us like pajama pants, um, uh, was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And, you know, like, here's what I think. I think it looks ridiculous to us, you know, nearly whatever it is, 170, whatever it is, years later. Uh, but I think we can just compare it to something in our, our own time. I think clothes signify, right? So think about masks, right? Are wearing masks in the past couple of years about wearing masks? I think years from now, people will say, what was the deal with the masks? Why were people, you know, having mask burnings? And but I think, um, like pantaloons, masks began to signify it. If if you were, you know, uh, uh, a supporter of President Trump or of a certain ideology, you would not wear a mask, whether or not you actually were worried about the virus. And if you were, uh, and so I think that cut on both sides. But I guess I'm just saying that the masks signified right 
in the way that I think the pantaloons signified. So pantaloons seem so goofy to us. But again, as with strength, everything about strength cuts both ways. The pantaloons were also very progressive. Women were wearing pantaloons, which we, we also know as bloomers, because Amelia Bloomer, the great proto-feminist, wore them as a symbol of women's agency and independence a year after they were already wearing them on Beaver Island. <laughs> so it's, you know, um, as always with Strang, and it was one of the great things about writing about him, you know, whether in uh, fiction or nonfiction, you know, you want to you want to try to give the character you're writing about three dimensions, but it's a lot easier when they come in with three dimensions, <laughs> you know, like he was really contradictory, interesting person. That was one of the things I love most about the book is that so little was black and white or easily explained one way or the other. It was, it was really fun in that way. Yeah. Uh, one of the sort of the connection to today, I, it made me think of, of this. It, it's really sort of interesting throughout the book, you know, in this um, sort of ante antebellum time period, you know, to hear that things being described as like, it's, it's sort of pre-apocalyptic, it's the end of the world, you know, people are, are, are feeling very worried about what's happening around them. Um, and I sort of feel like I hear similar sentiments today quite quite frequently. Do you see any similarities between the time period you wrote about and today? Or do you think people just always feel this way when there's instability? No, I think there were, I think there are real similarities. I, I also, you know, would always caution everyone that that it's interesting to make these parallels. It's also like um I'm not saying history has no antecedents. I just don't think history quite if it repeats itself not in the same way. So I think we live in our own distinct, completely weird time. Um, I was joking, I'm 61 years old and I was joking with some old high school friends just yesterday. You know, fellas, we thought we were gonna grow up and escape history, but boy, history is catching up with us, um, you know, with the headlines lately. So, um, um, but I do think this was a time of immense technological and social change and, um, and, that part of that was so so Karl Marx, who, who wrote the Communist Manifesto, right when Strang was um, Strang, and Strang was among many other things a proto-socialist, even though I'm sure he didn't read the Communist Manifesto. But I quote in the book this this notion of um, this phrase from the Communist Manifesto: "This uh, everything solid melts into air." I think is the the phrase. I may be paraphrasing it rather than quoting it exactly, but but whether or not you like Marx or the aftermath of Marx or whatever, I think Marx captured what a lot of people all over the world were feeling was like, I, there's nothing solid. There's nothing solid. And I think um, for some people um, that meant like, wow, we are at the, cause, cause the world was changing really quickly as it is now. You know, when people say, wow, I, I, I wish things were the way that the, the make America great again or whatever. I wish things were the way they were when I was a kid. Um, and they're just not, and they're not going to be. Um, not that the the future and the present don't have many joys, but this was, you know, America was like for the the first time it was this um, society of strangers, people moving around, not hanging out on the family farm, uh, urbanized society. It was um, it was a really different time, and I think people all over the world started to feel like the world was coming to an end. 1848 was a famous year for that when all sorts of uh, Armageddon and then there were you know these revolutions happening that that made people um uh feel that way um and you know uh Strang gave people a sense of order and um he he said to people like I have a plan um and not only that my plan is um to bring the second coming of Christ to Beaver Island <laughs> in the near future. That's that's what I'm promising. Um, and so I think that had a lot of appeal uh, to people. Um, but we see that all the time in, in, in times where there's just big social and um, technological and economic upheaval. Absolutely, that makes sense. Uh, you know, we touched a little bit on it earlier, but as you know, a member of a team of journalists, and, and I know that you are a journalist yourself, I'm curious about sort of Strang and the way that he was able to uh, use the media to sort of spread 
spread spread the word, sort of shape a narrative. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about what you learned about that and the way that he he was sort of a, a master manipulator of media? Yeah, so he had been both um, before he, so he had basically failed at everything he did. He grew up in this incredibly um, vibrant um, uh, part of Western New York that they called the burned over district. And they called it the burned over district because so many fires, mostly religious, but also social change blew through there. And so he grew up in that world and he grew up in a, a Baptist family, very strict. This was a time of religious revival, but he he made fun of, you know, they'd have these, they'd have these uh, uh, revivals and, and people would all, um, you know, come to Christ. And he made fun of that. He secretly wrote in his journal that he was an atheist. Um, but, but he was that was something that stuck with him. Then he gets kicked out of New York, and and before he leaves, he's a postmaster and he's a journalist, and those things stuck with him. There was this thing in journalism to answer your or or in the in the media that we had a great postal system in the United States and still do arguably, um, but there was this thing that the founding fathers or shortly thereafter Congress put in place was this exchange paper system, so that. If you had a newspaper, you could exchange papers with other newspapers for free. Well, um, what papers would do is they would take stories from other papers and they would use them in their own papers. Sometimes they would say, oh, this is from the Detroit Free Press, but often they would just publish the story. Well, a lot of people realized, wow, this is a way of getting stories from DC and New York out to the provinces. Strang realized this is a way of getting news from the provinces into DC. He was really good at writing kind of human interest stories that would get into bigger papers. And so there's an example in the book where, and I can't, I can't prove it, where it, suddenly there are um, a, a lot of people supposedly living in, in Burlington and Strang's new colony. I, I, I think it's 10,000 people. And um, that gets all over the East Coast that somehow 10,000 people are living there. Uh, and so, um, and it's way huge overestimation of what was happening there. Um, and then um, Strang goes to Milwaukee and he says, oh, the East Coast papers have it all wrong. It's not 10,000. But, and, and then another Wisconsin paper says, well, Strang probably planted that story, right? So um, to make it sound like, hey, you got to come to Burlington. This is, you know, the the Paris and New York and, you know, uh, combined uh, there on the banks of the Fox River. Um, but um, so he was really brilliant about about doing that. He the first thing he did on Beaver Island was set up a newspaper, quite a good newspaper, it must be said. I mean, <laughs> except for all the false information in it. It was very um, he's a good writer and um, an interesting writer. So and a good and, and good at getting the press out. That's really fascinating. I, to, he sort of reverse engineered the way that perhaps the, the system was designed and that's quite smart. Yeah, no, uh, I think that the, that con men thrive in, um, in that situation. Um, uh, there's another book I quite like, I'm looking at it now. It's uh, um, Pop, uh, Pope Brock's book, Charlatan, I, which I recommend to, to people in the book club. Um, and it's about this guy, Dr. Brinkley, um, mm -hmm. who, uh, there's no gentle way of putting this, is uh, they call him the goat gonad doctor. He was basically, um, um, the little blue pill of his time was to, to, he would sow goat gonads into men who were worried about their, I mean, it's just, it's just too crazy, but oh he was, it was a hugely popular procedure. Well, how did he advertise that? He, he was a radio pioneer. He had this, mm -hmm. he put in a huge radio station in, I'm trying to remember where, where he was first, Kansas, I think, and okay. would broadcast it all over the country. And he was, you know, among other things, he helped invent country music. You know, the Carter family would come on his station. And then he was kicked out of the United States and he just built a pirate radio station in Mexico. And so I, I think these times, there are these guys when they're, they're uh, guys, men and women who during times mm -hmm. of, you know, sort of, technological people figure out like, wow, I can use that. Like, I don't think Brinkley or Strang were like these technological theorists, but I think they, they realized, wow, newspapers, I can use that or radio stations that I can use, you know? So. 
That is wild. How interesting. Uh, I, I just want to ask you a couple more questions before we turn to some reader questions, because we've had quite a few. Um, I was curious is, you know, one of the things that was so fascinating to me was sort of the, the, the similarities between Millard Fillmore and Strang. Hmm. Um, just, you know, who I never, never would have thought to make that comparison, but that was so interesting. And just the idea of a warship in the Great Lakes just seemed so <laughs> wild. Were there anything about your research that just really surprised you as you were doing these? Um, well, everything surprised me. I mean, you know, there's this, as you know, from reading this book, there's this whole subplot about Strang's first wife traveling the country in men's clothing and passing, passing herself off as a man. And, um, you know, some people didn't believe it, <laughs> but, um, and weren't convinced, but a lot of people were more or less convinced. But it, I think it, I came to realize this because there was such huge signification in terms of clothing um, for what a woman is that people just couldn't believe like oh how could it be a woman if they're in men's clothing because a lot of women were passing at that time I mean it's really striking so uh, there were just all sorts of things that surprised me but I'll tell you one thing that surprised me is um, I guess I kind of knew this but just when this book takes place or at least at the beginning of when this book takes place our part of the world was the West, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. what we think about the 19th century, we think of the West as, you know, Montana or, you know, New Mexico or whatever. But really um, um, what we now call the Midwest, that term wasn't used for a really long time about us. We were the West and this was a place where you could go like Strang did, you know, he was basically, um, he had to fly by night, literally from New York. He, and according to his enemies, he faked his death before he went, but you could literally reinvent yourself on the frontier. So the frontier, the Midwestern frontier was this place where you could go and take on a whole new identity for good or evil, um, get it, make a new start. I think it's a very American thing. Um, but it was also the place that the, the con men, the counterfeiters um, liked too, because they could hang out um, and not be bothered. Um, and so uh, it was this, uh, this really weird kind of borderland place. So yeah, that, it didn't necessarily shock me, but I, but I was not aware of just um, how crazy the Midwest was at that time, what, or the West. Yeah. Me either. Me either. Uh, before I turn to our um, our reader questions, I just want to give you a chance because I'm very curious to know kind of what you're working on now and, and if there's anything our readers should be should know about or be on the lookout for. Oh, I work so slowly that uh, it like d be on the lookout like, you know, within this lifetime are you talking about? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am working on a, on a few projects now and I, yeah, I'm not, this isn't me being the, uh, pretentious superstitious author, but I, um, I, I haven't quite settled on my next nonfiction project, although I'm kind of having some discussions about it, but, um, but I'd love to do someone, I, I gotta say, like, I'd love to write about someone as rich and interesting as, as this person. I mean, for all Strang's faults, I really uh, savored my time with him. Um, mm -hmm. I just, um, he was endlessly contradictory and interesting person to write about. I, I wouldn't want to have, to have been a friend because uh, I don't think he was very good at making or keeping those. I think he was, you know, we might call him narcissistic something, sociopath something, something, you know, but to write about he was a pretty fascinating guy so i'm hoping to find some something that captures my imagination in that way too that's cool yeah all right so i'm going to turn us to some of our reader questions because there's some great ones okay. uh lawrence was wondering and are you aware are there any traces of strength kingdom on beaver island today <laughs> uh you know i might share something with you um so um uh, I might share something on the screen. Let me give you, okay, let me give you, uh, I make sure that, there you go. So, so I'll see if I can find this really quickly. Uh, um, we'll go down. So, um, so there's Strang and, and um, on Beaver Island, there's very little 
And, but, but it's funny, like Strang hangs, his shadow hangs large over Beaver Island, right? They, they remember the history. Um, but it's so weird to me that, um, here, let me go down here. Um, this is Burlington, Wisconsin, and this is the house that Strang died in. This is a picture I took last summer of the house. Um, and uh, I was kayaking on the Fox River with a friend and I, I, we were near Burlington. I said, hey, you wanna see some of the Strang stuff? And he said, yeah, sure. And so I took him to this house and there was a guy in a rider mower <laughs> out front, this kid, you know, maybe, maybe in his, I think he was in his probably mid twenties, maybe early thirties or maybe older, or younger, who's out there, you know, cutting back and forth with his rider mower. And I said, do you live here? And he goes, oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what happened here? He goes, oh dude, my boss told me some crazy stuff happened here. <laughs> like, yeah, some crazy stuff happened here. And he's, and, but he had no idea. And literally I've gotten emails from people who've seen me speak who live in Burlington, where there are plenty of um, uh, remnants of Strang. This is the house Strang died in, it's still up. Um, uh, in Burlington, in this little town in Wisconsin, two hours Northwest of Chicago. And um, uh, in that case, they just, the history's there and they're not interested particularly. Uh, someone wrote me from Burlington saying, I live in Burlington. Where is this stuff? Very skeptically. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, turn left at your house and drive a mile and then you'll see this house. You know what I mean? And there's plaques mm -hmm. up in Burlington, but I, but it's, it's funny how like this place where Strang, most traces of Strang are gone. The, the place names are all still there in, in Burlington, um, you know, including St. James, St. James Strang is the only time, I mean, in, on Beaver Island, um, St. James is the only town on Beaver Island, really. And a lot of the place names are there. But there's very little. There's a his old uh, publishing shop. I don't even know how much of that is original. And there's another house that's supposed to be from the Strang era. But m mostly, when the when the Mormons were routed out of um, Beaver Island, they t they had to take the culture with them. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Oh, here I'll show. You. Uh, this is this is me in uh, in front of. The Strangite Church in in Burlington. Uh -huh. These are the last I, the last remnants that you can see the word Strangite there. Um, yeah, and that's right in Burlington. So, uh, with with actual adherents of Strang there. Very actually, that leads right into one of the questions received Jay, that we received. James asked, "Does the mainstream Mormon Church today acknowledge the Strang sect?" Uh, no, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I didn't. Pr pr so I, I should say I'm certainly not an expert on Mormonism. I've read more than the average <laughs> Joe, um, but I'm not a, I'm not a Mormon and um, I don't. So um, look, the Mormon church kicked Strang out <laughs> a long, long time ago. So he, he's, he's an apostate. So they're not that interested in him. He's mentioned in a lot of books about Brigham Young, uh, some books about Joseph Smith, about the history of the church. Basically, and I, and I, this is another way my book advances this story, and I think it's very real. He posed a real threat to Brigham Young. You know, when Joseph Smith did, hadn't named a successor when he died or was killed in 1844, I think, and and Strang claimed to be the next in line, and and he had some advantages on Brigham Young, and even you know much later when Strang was in the the Michigan House, there was a chance he was going to be named governor of Utah. So he went out to right. Washington to try to lobby for it. I, I, anyway, it's in the book. But but um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think um, mainstream Mormons, some of them, a lot, a lot of them don't know about Strang. You know, I was on a fair amount of podcasts and whatnot, and people were like, this is amazing. I never heard this story growing up. And I'm like, OK, so but I don't think it's uh, I don't think Strang is, um, you know, a big figure in church history. OK. And probably because, just because Brigham Young was, what he did, whether or not you admire Brigham Young or not, he, he what he did was absolutely amazing. This move west from Nauvoo into completely unknown territory in certain ways and starting this utopian kingdom in Utah. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Utopian colony and, and it's absolutely amazing what he was he was able to accomplish. His organizational skills must have been off the charts. Absolutely. 
This is a fascinating one. Janice says, our family descends from one of the people who testified against Strang and was declared an apostate. For their family, their settlement at Beaver Island was a blend of eccentric faith, but perhaps more so a chance for property. Do you know how many were influenced one way or the other? Sure. I mean, that's, I'd like, <laughs> I wish I'd met you before I edited the book. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, you know, the, the, the history of the, the West, including our part of the, the, the West, um, is a history of um, land appropriation uh, from Native Americans. And in this case, Strang's case, it was land appropriation. The federal government had just appropriated Beaver Island in a treaty from um, Native Americans, and Strang appropriated <laughs> Beaver Island from the federal government. So <laughs> uh, that, that was all federal land. And in fact, when Strang was arrested, um, you know, we didn't talk about that, but, but I guess most people here read about it um, and brought back to Detroit. That those the the lumber poaching charges against him were the real charges, and mm. part uh, this prosecutor um, who Strang was found innocent in in the first round. I think he wanted to get him on something sexy like counterfeiting, um, but really like stealing trees was a huge deal, you know. Um, Trees have been from Michigan in that period have been described as green gold. You know, not only um, these incredible tall pine trees are what, among other things, made the settlings of the uh, the settling of the prairies possible. Um, and so, um, stealing trees and Strang was brilliant about like mining trees. So yeah, it could just be that people wanted some property. Sure. Yeah, and and like we're complex humans, so you might have wanted some property and. It seemed kind sure. of cool to be in this utopian adventure. Absolutely. Uh, Chris wonders, you know, in your opinion, do you think Strang was was really just a great self promoter, or did he truly believe he was a prophet? So that's the million dollar question, and I don't unfortunately have an answer to it. But what, what I will say is, I think you can have. I I think it may be uh, what they call a false dichotomy. You know, I think two things can exist at once. I think you can know you're lying to someone and think that because you're you, you get to lie to someone and that it's not an offense, right? Um, that you're you're so special, you know, that um, your lying is a good thing, right? Um, and so uh, I think that Strang might have seen himself as a prophet and a con man at once. And thought the con man was justified because he was a leader of human beings, and um, you know, I, I don't know, I can't, I can't psychoanalyze him. But he did, he did, sure. you know, I think he truly felt that he was a great, he was destined for greatness, and we see this from early on in his diaries, which yeah. are still available um, when he was a young man, but. You know, and there's letters to his brother, you know, in mid, you know, mid career, you know, it's just his, um, his, you know, again, I, I'm not into psychoanalyzing someone that that's for other people. Plus, I don't like pigeonholing people. I think the shagginess of all of our um, selfhood is what makes us great. Um, but um, Strang definitely was uh, narcissistic in some way. He really thought he was, he was something else. Fair enough. Well, uh, we're coming up near the end of our time. I just wanted to give you a chance, Miles, if there's anything sort of, you know, concluding thoughts, anything you want to make sure our readers leave thinking about, or just anything that you want to make sure that we know. And also, we're, I'm just curious, as a, as a Michigander, and that you are, are a U of M alum, do you ever get up to Michigan anymore? Do you ever, are you ever able to oh, make it back to our great state? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, one of the joys of this book I mean, I have very strong feelings about University of Michigan Ann Arbor because I have a I got my MFA in creative writing there, and that was a transformational experience for me. Uh, made lifetime friends. It super affected my writing. Worked with uh, great writers like Charles Baxter and Nicholas Del Banco. Um, um, and then I had I was blessed to do a year long journalism fellowship with the Knight uh, Wallace uh, Journalism Fellow. So I was hanging out all year with and traveling the world with journalists from all over the world. It was, an, again, made some lifetime friends. I want a couple of whom I'm gonna see this weekend. 
So yeah, but it was just fun to be back <laughs> in Michigan. And you know, like just going up to Beaver Island is great. I mean, I just, uh, it's such a strange, interesting uh, place. Um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place for those of you who hadn't been there, but still mostly the King's Highway, King Strang, uh, which Strang had, had had built. I mean, it, obviously he didn't, it wasn't asphalt in his day is the only like big paved road on the island. It's not even big, it's a two lane. And the rest of the island is stunningly gorgeous and dirt roads, or not dirt roads, gravel roads. So mm -hmm. um, uh, you, it, you get really dirty driving around up there with an open window, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, so and, no, I'm just grateful uh, um, for this opportunity. And I'm so grateful to you for reading my book. It was a blast to write, I hope it was a blast to read. It sure was. And I think that many of our, I'm seeing nodding heads. I know that many of our readers agree they loved this book. And we are just so grateful for your willingness to spend an hour with us. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Josiah Foster, who's going to close out our afternoon together. Thanks, Amber. All right. Thank you, Miles, so much for talking to us about your book. Um, the King of Confidence. And I want to thank Amber for moderating um, these questions and uh, getting to our readers' questions. I want to remind everybody that we'll be posting this recording on Bridge Michigan later on this week. So wherever you get your Bridge news, um, you should see this post coming up real soon. I want to announce that our final book club is on October 12th. Um, and the announcement will be coming sometime soon, so be on the lookout for that. I want to remind you that um, if you are a, a Bridge Michigan member, you will receive the book, uh, book for free at no cost. If you're not a Bridge Michigan member, I highly suggest you become one if you want to receive the next book. Um, I want to thank you. Thank you all again for coming out here um, in the middle of the day, taking your eating your lunch with us and just learning more about the book. Hey, just um, can I, I jump in? Can, yeah, I, sure just want, I just want to um, plug what Bridge, I, as a longtime journalist, I just want to plug what Bridge is doing and what you, this great experiment you're all part of. Um, journalism is essential to our democracy and is in um, real trouble right now. And um, ventures like Bridge are just so exciting and important. So thanks. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, Josiah. I just wanted to so put in my started. personal plug. Oh, thank you so much for the compliment. Yeah, thank, thank you guys all for showing up. Have a great and wonderful weekend. Bye all. Thank you.